welcome to Shepherd of the Valley's online worship service. We're thankful that you found us today and pray that this worship service is a blessing for you and for your family. One quick announcement for our SVL folks that are part of our Mission Church. This coming week, we're going to start our online connect groups. Those will be on Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. and Thursday evening at 7 p.m. So watch your email for a link um, as we'll take a deeper dive into the sermon text that we look at on, uh, on the Sunday morning. If you're joining us uh, for worship this morning, you'll want a couple of housekeeping items. In the description below the video on YouTube, you will find uh, links to an online digital connection card. We'd love to hear from you where you're worshiping from. And if you're local, our congregation can be of any service to you. You'll find a link there for the worship folder if you'd like to have a printed copy with you as we go through the service this morning. All the words and the text that, and the responses will also be on the screen for you though too. And there's also a link there for online giving. If you're a member of our congregation and you want to utilize that opportunity to continue to support our congregation's ministry, please click on the link and you'll be able to do that there. This Sunday is the fifth Sunday in the season of Easter, and we're continuing our series entitled, What Happens When Our Plans Fall Through? Today we'll take a look at Jesus' disciples and see a group of men who had very troubled hearts. But we'll see what Jesus did with those disciples' hearts and with our hearts as well. He brings comfort for those troubled hearts. Let's begin our worship service this morning. We're going to begin with an opening song. It's the song, Alleluia, Jesus Lives. We'll sing two verses of that song. God bless your worship. by his great strength. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. Dear friends, Jesus tells us he is the way, the truth, and the life. Through him we stand in God's grace and are saved. We approach God today with troubled hearts, filled with fears, worries, and guilt. Let's approach God's mercy seat, asking him to forgive and restore us for the sake of Jesus. Lord God, merciful Father, I am troubled by my guilt, overcome by fear, and destroyed by my worry. I have lost my way, followed my own truth, and because of that, do not deserve eternal life with you. Forgive me for the sake of Jesus, your Son, who died and rose from the dead for me. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Your Savior Jesus lived the perfect life you have not lived, trusted in God fully, and paid for all you've done wrong with his own life. 
He rose from the dead triumphantly and is the way to the Father and eternal life. Hear the truth of what Jesus has done for you. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let's continue with the last two verses of the song, Alleluia, Jesus Lives. So that among the changes and challenges in this world, our hearts would yearn more and more for the everlasting joys of heaven. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Amen. At this time I have a special message for the kids, a little devotion for them. So kids, pay attention. Uh, this message is specifically for you. I'm going to let you in on a little secret that I know. I have a friend a good friend named Josh, and he works at a local bakery. And it's the best bakery in all of Arvada. And if you want some amazing cinnamon rolls or an awesome cake, you're going to want to go to this bakery. It's called Das Meyer Bakery. It's, it's a secret that you may not know, but now I'm letting you know that you need to go to Das Meyer. And if you're not able to go, your parents need to take you there to get you some cinnamon rolls or some cake for your, for your dessert this week or your breakfast. But my question for you is, do you know the way to Das Meyer Bakery? Probably not, right? Imagine if, if you were just going to start walking. How would you get there? How would you find your way to Das Meyer Bakery? Do you know what you would use if you didn't know the way? You would use a map. On your, on your parents' phone or on your phone if you have one, there's an app called Google Maps, and on there is an, a way to find directions so that you can get to the place you want to go. So at the top, I typed in Das Meyer Bakery and hit directions, and now I know exactly how to get to Das Meyer. The map on my phone shows me the way to the place that I want to get to. Do you know how to get to heaven? A lot of people have ideas on how to get to heaven. A lot of people think, well, if, I, if I'm just really, really good, I can get there. Other people say, well, if I'm better than a lot of other people and lead a good life, better than most, I'll get there. And other people say, I don't know. I, I'm kind of confused if I'm going to be in heaven. Can you imagine if you didn't know the way to heaven? That would be even, even worse than not knowing the, the directions to Das Meyer Bakery. But I'm going to tell you a secret this morning. You do know the way to heaven. And, and it starts with the letter J and it lends, ends with the letter S. The way to heaven is Jesus. Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus, who, who died on the cross for you and rose from the dead for you, he's the one who shows you the way to heaven. It's through faith in Jesus that now we know we will be in heaven. All right, let's fold our hands, and we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to say a line, and then I'd like you to repeat it after me. Dear Jesus, I can't wait to be in heaven with you. Thank you for being the way to eternal life. Amen. All right, thanks for your attention. 
We're going to continue with the scripture lessons now. Two scripture lessons. The first one comes from the book of 1 Kings. This takes us to a time in Israel's history when many people in the nation were not worshiping the true God. They were worshiping a false idol named Baal and Asherah and a variety of others. And what Elijah does here is show the people of Israel the almighty power of God. That all of their idols were worthless. They were taking them on a path away from God. Their idols were dead. They had no life. And their idols were feeding them lies. Only from the true God, only through the true God and his son Jesus do we know the way, the truth, and the life. 1 Kings chapter 18. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your families, your, fa your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now some of the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bowl given them and prepared it. Then they called in the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us! They shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder! He said, surely he has a God. Perhaps he is, he's deep in thought or, or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder, slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response, no one answered, no one paid attention. And Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seahs of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. This is God's word. We'll continue with two, two verses of the song, Christ is our cornerstone.
is the gospel for this Sunday, John 14, verses 1 through 12. We'll focus on this section during the sermon this morning. Jesus is speaking, and he said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? Words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let's continue with the next two verses of the song, Christ is Our Cornerstone. This, this happiness about who God is and what he's, what he's done for them. They, they have their lives all together and everything seems to go fine for them. That's how we imagine Christians are, who they are. And then I asked them, is that who you are? And every single one of them responded, no. One person said, you know, I'm trying to make ends meet right now because I have a family and no job. And the savings and the unemployment are only going to last for so long. And after that, I just don't know what we're going to do. Another person said, you know, I would just love a moment of peace. And you know what I do to get a moment of peace? I lock myself in the bathroom for a few minutes. Because right now I'm working from home, and we're parents, and we're also teaching our kids all the lessons that they need for school. And the, the few moments that I get alone are usually when I can lock myself away in the bathroom 
or I'm just so relieved and so overwhelmed when they go to bed at night. Another person said, you know, I'm just sick of the loneliness. Zoom calls are, are great, phone calls are fine, text messages are okay, but I just want to see people. I mean, I just get so stir-crazy, I'm so lonely, I'm, I'm so beside myself right now. It's gotten so bad, I look forward to going to the grocery store at the end of the week. Another person said, you know, I would just love to know what the tunnel is and what's the light at the end of the tunnel. I, I want to know where is the end and what is the end and what does it look like for all of this that we're going through right now. Every single one of those people that I was chatting with was sharing with me the fact that their hearts were troubled. They found themselves in, in this camp of troubled hearted Christians. So which camp do you find yourself in? You find yourself in the camp of Christians who have rock solid faith, the steady joy and everything is all right. They have their lives together and everything just seems to be okay. Or do you find yourself in this camp with a troubled heart? If you find yourself in this camp, I, I want to let you know you're not the anomaly in the Christian church. You're the norm. If you don't believe me, then did you hear the attitude of Jesus' disciples in John 14? These are Jesus' disciples. The ones handpicked by him to be the next leaders, the, the first leaders of the Christian church. And how did Jesus describe them? Their hearts were troubled. Like a, like a pot of water that had just been stirred up again and again and again and the water is just swirling around. Like, like an ocean that had just been lambasted by a, a hurricane and the water and the waves are just crashing everywhere. That's what's going on in their hearts. John chapter 14 takes us to the night that Jesus was betrayed. The, John 14 takes place in the upper room where Jesus and his disciples had eaten the, the Passover. And just prior to this, the disciples had heard and seen a lot of things that left their hearts troubled. Jesus told them that, that he was going away. They, they wouldn't see him anymore. And then a little while later, Jesus said that one of their own, one of the twelve, was going to betray him to his enemies. And then a short while after that, Judas, one of the disciples, stood up and left the room without a word, no explanation whatsoever. And then Jesus looked at Peter and told Peter that, that he would deny his Savior not once, not twice, but three times that very night. And then he said to the disciples, all of you are going to fall away on account of me. And after all those bombshells had dropped, and in spite of and all, all those things had happened, the disciples were thinking back to the beginning of that night when all 12 of them were bickering and arguing, arguing about which one of them was the greatest which one of them was the most valuable disciple? Which one of them was, was the top dog of all 12 of them? And then they were all humbled when Jesus, the Savior of the world, took a bowl of water, got down on his knees, and washed their dirty, smelly feet. All of those things were going through their heart and their mind, and it left their hearts troubled. If you're sitting here watching this today, or tonight, or whenever you're watching it, and you have a troubled heart, I want to let you know you're not alone. You're, you're part of a, a group of people that at times have troubled hearts. This is part of living on this, in this world. But Jesus does not want to leave you with a troubled heart. Nor does he want to leave his disciples with a troubled heart. And so Jesus goes into action to bring comfort to those disciples who had troubled hearts. And that's what Jesus will do for you today in John chapter 14. Jesus brings comfort to troubled hearts. And he's going to do that in two ways. He's going to do that, first of all, with the future joys that await us. And he's also going to remind us of the present realities that accompany us. So let's take a look at the first section of John, verses, 14, verses 1 through 6 of John chapter 14. We're going to see how... Jesus shares with us future joys that await us. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me 
that you also may be where I am. You know the place to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The world doesn't work properly, does it? I, I think we've all been acutely aware of that recently, especially. Whether it's your health and your job, your livelihood, your mental well-being, school, summer plans, spring plans, graduations, future, whatever it is, everything was rolling in the right direction. All of a sudden a virus came and everything just came crashing down and left us with troubled hearts. The world is broken. But, but not just the world itself, even in our own lives, our own heart is broken. We, we look inside and we, we see the things we've done wrong. We remember the things we've said and we regret them. The horrible things we've said to other people. The actions we, we didn't take and we should have taken. The, the things we did that we shouldn't have done. And it leaves us with this heavy baggage and it just leaves us burdened and, and leaves our heart troubled. The world is broken. Maybe you've had the experience in life when you, you're, you finally feel like you're getting ahead of the curve. You know, for a few months you had a lot of bills that, you were, that were piling up and you, you slowly paid them down. And then you had a couple of months where nothing big was happening, everything's all right, okay, I can take a deep breath now. And then you got in your car, you started driving down the road, and what's that, what's that noise? I do not, uh, no, 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 I don't, I don't need this now, I don't need this now. And you, you pulled it into the shop, and the, the guy looked at it, and he said, well, struts, suspension, brakes. And the cost is not going to be hundreds, it's going to be thousands of dollars. You shake your head to yourself, no, 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 I don't need this right now, I don't need this right now. And you get text messages later on in the day from one of your kids, um, I need to go to the orthodontist because some of the brackets fell off of my teeth. And then that night, you get an email from the insurance company. Remember that time you were at the hospital, you were at the doctor, and you thought the insurance covered the whole thing? Well, guess what? They found a, a part of it, a segment of what was done to you, and they decided, oh, we're not going to cover that. And now you're going to have to fight with the insurance company to make sure it's paid, or it's up to you. And all of a sudden, instead of finding yourself ahead of the curve, you find yourself right back behind the curve. You just long for the rest and the restoration you just can't seem to find here on this earth. In the, in the mid-20th century, there was a great Christian writer named C.S. Lewis, and he talked about this very thing, this, this very idea that, that there's, there's no satisfaction for the thing that is wrong with our life. There's, there's no earthly satisfaction to be found. We're, we're longing for rest, we're longing for restoration, but we just can't find it on this earth, and he made a point about that. Take a look at this, uh, take a look at this slide, this quote from C.S. Lewis. He said, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. It's true. You were not made to, to be here in the brokenness of, of earth. You were made to be with God forever. You were made to spend eternity with God in, in his heaven. And that's precisely what Jesus told his disciples he was going to do for them. He was going to the Father, going to heaven to prepare a place for them, to reserve a spot with God for all eternity in heaven. A place where there is perfect peace, perfect rest, perfect restoration. Where there are no more troubled hearts, where you don't have to worry about falling behind the curve, because there's no curve to fall behind. Instead, you have nothing but the everlasting joy and perfection of being with God. And Jesus, over the next three days after this section in John 14, would go and make sure that every barrier that stood in your way of being with God forever in heaven was gone. He went and, and died on the cross to, to take away all of your sins, all of your guilt has been paid for, so that now through Jesus, you have the way to God. It's open. The way to God is through Jesus. 
He rose from the dead triumphant, so that now life is given through him. He is your life. He gives you eternal life. And now instead of saying to yourself, I'm a, I'm a wrath-deserving, wretched sinner who deserves nothing good from God, the truth that Jesus declares to you is that you are a forgiven, redeemed child of God, child of the Heavenly Father. You belong to him. And he says to you this truth, you will be with him for all eternity. That is the future joy that awaits you. That's the calm that Jesus, the comfort that Jesus brings to troubled hearts who look around at the chaos and the confusion and wonder, what is going on? Jesus lifts our eyes heavenward to remind us there's a time when this will all end and we will be with God for all eternity. And perhaps if we as, as, as Christians learn nothing else from this pandemic, maybe one thing we'll learn and one thing will happen is that it will draw our eyes heavenward even more, creating us an even deeper longing to be with God in heaven forever and to stop looking so frivolously for the security and the satisfaction that we long for but we can't find here on earth. Sounds great, doesn't it? Maybe you're thinking to yourself, that's wonderful, I want it now, but we have to wait a little bit, aren't we? Maybe the Lord has in mind for you a few weeks. Maybe the Lord has in mind for you many decades before you get to heaven. So what about now? What is Jesus going to give us now to comfort us, to calm us, our troubled hearts here and now? We, we know that that future awaits us and it calms us and comforts us, but we also want to know that here and now everything will be okay. You know, recently at our house, we were running into an issue with our toddler. She, she used to sleep in until 7 a.m. And then all of a sudden, a few months ago, she decided that, that 5 a.m., 5.30 a.m., 6 a.m. were good times to wake up. And I'm usually up at that hour, but it's because I'm either doing personal Bible study or I'm doing a devotion or I'm just getting work done before the kids wake up. And the other issue we created is because it was that she was getting more and more tired and then crankier before her nap. So what we did is bought a, a nightlight that went in her room and we put it up on her dresser and we could program it to turn on at a certain hour. And we told her, okay, when that light goes on, you can get out of bed. And man, she was a champ. She stayed in bed the next day until the light came on. She came downstairs, was so excited and proud of herself. Daddy! Daddy, the light is on! The light is on! I can wake! I can wake! And it was going great for a couple months. Then all of a sudden, this last week, you know what that little turkey decided to do? She decided to get up before the light was on! All of a sudden, 6 a.m., she's wandering downstairs. Daddy, sun's awake, I'm awake. Sun's awake, I'm awake. It was very cute, and I hated to do what I was about to do. But her light didn't come on. So I looked at her and I asked her, Ellie, did your light come on? And she lost it. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. So I took her upstairs and I put her back in bed. I wrapped her up with her blanket and I gave her her baby and I gave her a couple books. I said, all right, I want you to read your books to your baby until that light comes on. And she sat there and waited. And periodically she'd turn and look it wasn't on, and she'd keep on reading, and she kept on reading her books until the light came on and she went downstairs. What is God giving to you and I right here, right now? Well, we wait for the light, not the light to turn on, right, but until we wait till that moment when we're in heaven. Let's take a look at John chapter 14, verses 7 through 11, and see the present realities that accompany us here on earth. Jesus continued on. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has, been, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, 
and the Father is in me. Or at least, believe on the evidence of the works themselves. This is God's word. Philip heard what Jesus said, but, but he wanted something more. As Philip thought about all the things that Jesus had said and all the chaos that was about to ensue, and he, he, said to, he says to Jesus, show us the Father, that will be enough. Just show us God. Show us that in the midst of everything that's going wrong, as things unravel, as all these things take place that you told us about, just show us that God is here. That God is with us, that God hasn't abandoned us. You ever thought about that? Or maybe thought that very same thing? God, why don't you just show me that you're here so that I, I know that you are still working your plan for me, that you are still present, you are still with me, and you haven't lost control. So Jesus heard what Philip said, and he gave Philip something even better. He said, Philip, don't you realize that when you have me, you have God? Jesus is God. God is Jesus. Philip, you, dear Christian friend, when you have Jesus, you have God. Jesus and the Father are one, and the same, one are one. And the Father and the Son accompany you throughout your entire life. And even later on in John chapter 14, a few verses after this, Jesus would say that he would send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would dwell within the, within the disciples. So get this, understand this. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the triune God, lives in you, accompanies you throughout your entire life. You and I cannot begin to imagine the amount of control, the amount of concern, and the amount of work that God is putting into your life right now. Wherever you go, God goes with you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, touching everything that's happening in your life to make sure that it doesn't separate you from God, to make sure that it works out for your good, to make sure that you are provided for, to make sure that you are taken care of, and to make sure that you get to your eternal home in heaven. You know, if, if the Father in heaven is going to send his Son into this world to give you that future joy of heaven that awaits you, do you think he's going to abandon you in your present reality? No. The reality is, dear friend, that, that God is with you all the time. God has chosen to live within you. That's his promise. When you were baptized, God made his home in your heart. God is within you. God is working through you. And not only that, but he's, he's left us with the words, his word in Scripture. Word of comfort. Word of strengthening. Word in times of trouble that we dive into to have our hearts calmed again. Until that future joy comes, until that light comes on, God does not just put us in a bed and give us some things to distract us. Don't look over here what's happening, and you just do your thing over here. It'll be okay. Jesus sits right there with us. Every single step of our journey through life, Jesus is with us until that wonderful day when we get to be at home with him in heaven. So wherever you're at right now, and if your heart is troubled, remember who your Savior is and what he's done for you. If your heart feels like that big pot of water that's being stirred up again and again and again and just going around and around, you know how it is you stop that water from spinning? You stick the spoon back in and you go in the opposite direction. And all of a sudden that water calms down. Your friends, when you find yourself in that camp of Christians that have troubled hearts, remember that Jesus accompanies you. He's the one who has inserted himself into your life to make sure that your heart is calm and comforted. The one who has given you his word to accompany you on your journey to make sure that you are with him in heaven forever. Amen. At this time, we will make confession of our faith. Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to join in, those, uh, join in those words with us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to continue with some special prayers, and then we will follow that up with the Lord's Prayer. Please join your hearts with me in prayer. O merciful Father, you have compassion upon the sick and those in need, and have promised not to ignore them in their afflictions. Turn back the pandemic across the globe and give us relief. Bless the sick with healing, those who suffer with strength and patience, and the dying with peace. Gracious Lord, you have established the home and bless those who show us your love. Bless all mothers and the children in their care. Thank you for mothers who gave and sustained our life, sacrificed for us, and shared Jesus with us. Bless all families and make their homes places of blessing and love where your word is spoken, forgiveness reigns, and love is displayed. Compassionate Father, you are not aloof from the needs of this body and life. And you have called us to love our neighbor in need and give aid to the poor. Give us courage and faith that we may not fear sharing the resources you have supplied with those who live and want, especially the widow, the orphan, and the unemployed. Let love be perfected among us to drive out selfish fears. We praise you, God, for your goodness in hearing the prayers of your people and granting us confidence to approach your throne of mercy. Hear us now in the name of and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our worship service. A uh, very special Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers that are watching us. Thank you for all you've done and sacrificed and given to your children and your families. We can never say thank you enough. And we hope that your family lavishes on you just wonderful um, blessings and thanksgiving um, on this wonderful Mother's Day. God be with all of you. Look forward to worshiping with you next week. Have a blessed week in the Lord.